am asking for is $1,100 a month for the next two years. That's, That's insane. insane. Hannah. Oh, Jesus, Hannah. A scene from the hit HBO series Girls, starring Lena Dunham as the frank and funny Hannah. Since its premiere in 2012, the show has become a touchstone for the millennial generation. It's thanks in large part to Dunham, who created Girls and based Hannah on some of her own experiences. Now she's delivered a book of very personal essays. Dunham sat down with Gian Gameshi, host of CBC Radio's Q. You are from New York, therefore you are just naturally interesting. We can't keep bankrolling your groovy lifestyle. You said it was cheaper for you if I was on the family plan. Lena Dunham has been nominated for eight Emmys. Lena Dunham, girl! It's won two Golden Globes, including Best Actress for her role as the quirky Hannah Horvath. Lena Dunham is the star, but that's not all. She's writer, director, and executive producer. Everything that's been so terrible and painful in the last few months was leading me to this point. The show has been heralded for being real and raw. It captures the lives of four young women trying to make it in New York after college. What is wrong with people? It chronicles their missteps and successes along the way. You will never judge me again. At age 28, the young star has now taken her storytelling to print in her highly anticipated memoir, Not That Kind of Girl. A young woman tells you what she's learned. It's a great pleasure to have you here and on Thank the you. occasion of this new book. Now, why was it time to write a book of personal oh. essays? I wanted to give sort of a sense of the lessons that I've learned, but as you see in the title, learned is in quotes, because I think, you know, being a 28-year-old telling other 28-year-olds how to live is a is tricky ground to stand Although on. Although it suggests that you are aware that you're considered a role model. You know, it depends. I mean, I'm sure some people consider me the opposite of a role model, but, you know, I think I take that really seriously. If any young women or young people are watching what I'm doing for clues, I take that super seriously. Who do you think considers you the opposite of a role model? Um, American Republicans. Uh, you know, women who have an issue with sort of my version of feminism, the way that I, you know, am dealing with my body on television. Um, those would be the first two examples that came to mind. Mm. I'm aware of the criticisms and I'm able to, I'm able to live with them. On the cover of the book, the what she has learned, what you've learned is in quotation marks. Yeah. Why is it in quotation marks? That was really important to me. My publisher was like, should we just take off the quotes? And I was like, no, if we take off the quotes, then it seems like I'm telling you that I've come to some enlightened place in my Haven't life. Haven't you? You've learned some things. I've learned some things, but I still, you know, ate french fries for breakfast at two in the afternoon yesterday. So it's like, I haven't learned enough. And I also think, you know, part of being in your 20s and part of being human is that you're in a constantly transitional place. And so trying to give any sort of didactic, clear advice about the right way to live would be a mistake. You're very candid in oh. this memoir. Um, horrible sex, dieting, mm -hmm. lists of what you ate for a while when that you were on That was the most diets. embarrassing part, the uh, list of what I ate. Sexism in your industry, your regrets. I mean, you are, the sort of idea of Lena Dunham is, is that she's an open book. Yeah. Well, when did that start? Probably like the minute I started talking. Like I just never had a comfort with the idea of things that were supposed to be kept secret. And I think I, from an early age, found the concept of secrecy really destructive, at least for me, and felt like I wanted to, just shame was a feeling that I didn't want to live with. There's a lot of revelations here. There's, I mean, there's a lot of uh, open, candid stuff here. You just said a moment ago that the, the lists of food were the most embarrassing? Yeah. Well, I, why? So much of my public image has been as a woman who doesn't care what people think about my body. And so to admit in the pages of the book that I went through a phase where every almond that I put in my mouth was recorded felt like a real inconsistency in my personal mm -hmm. politics, and that was stressful. But the thing that's comforting is how many other women have gone, that is my mm -hmm. experience with yeah. food. And that is my, ex or have gone, that is my experience with sex. Lena Dunham was raised in Brooklyn, New York. Both of her parents are visual artists. In her memoir, she speaks candidly about growing up and not quite fitting in. What kind of kid were you? How, how, how do you characterize a young Lena Dunham? I mean, I think I was always much more comfortable with adults than I was with other kids. I had this amazing 
access to my parents' world of all these people who were creatively engaged and intelligent and funny and strange, and those were the people that I wanted to be with, and so there was a little bit of like a come down when you go to kindergarten and are like, oh, <laughs> oh, this is what we're doing. And so I'm not saying I was the most precocious or the most brilliant, I just, that's where I felt comfortable. And did other kids feel that? I did not have friends until I was like 14, I would say. Like it took me a Any real- Any friends? Not, I had one friend who's still my friend, she, but she didn't go to school with me. Hmm. We, I had an outside of school friend who was kind of like, Lena's weird, but I'm okay with it. And that's kind of still how she feels. Um, I, I'm sure I missed out on some real pleasurable aspects of childhood, but I also, you know, I have obsessive compulsive disorder and it started manifesting itself when I was five. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I had an opportunity to exist in a carefree way. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of the book you talk about as a kid starting therapy because you were afraid of everything. Yeah. Uh, where are you at with what we sort of crudely call mental health issues now? Yeah, where I'm at with mental health issues is that I've personally never felt better because I'm allowed to have these incredible outlets to talk about what I'm feeling and I have amazing resources and I have great insurance and I have great, you know, like I have the luckiest possible situation a person with my particular temperament could be in. And mm -hmm. so I feel lucky and I feel like it's my responsibility as a person who's been through that um, to talk about it in an open way. Do you still feel like you're, you're hiding on some level? Are there, uh, I think something that can be hard is that people want you to go, I used to have this and now I'm cured. Hmm. And the fact is, is you're now, it's a, I still go through phases of crippling anxiety and I feel like I have this great life and I have this great job and you know, you don't wanna go, I'm out of my head with anxiety right now because you're like, I'm the captain of the ship and I don't wanna scare everybody. <laughs> I live here with my mom and my sister, who's 17. I just got off a plane from Ohio. I'm in a postgraduate delirium. I think you sound like you're in the epilogue to Felicity. It was Dunham's 2010 indie film, Tiny Furniture, that put her name on the map. Seems like you had sort of a lot of boyfriends. I didn't. I was just trying stuff out. Probably kind of like what you were doing. She cast her own mother and sister in the story about a girl who moves home after college. The success of that film caught the attention of HBO executives. My entire life has been one mistake. Two years later, Girls premiere. Its subject matter seemed to immediately resonate with a young audience. I mean, I think we were really lucky to appear at a moment when women my age were ready to see stories about themselves, parents were ready to see stories about their children, and people were looking for more honest content about women. And so, like, I feel like I'm suddenly living in this amazing moment for women on television that was, it was really exciting to be a part of that. You're not afraid to be vulnerable or expose yourself on screen, literally. There's a lot of uh, sex and nudity on girls. You write in the book how often you get asked how it is you're brave enough yeah. to reveal your body on screen. What do you make of questions like that? What I say in the book is it feels very pointed because it feels like how are you brave enough considering the body that you have? It feels like it's very specific to not fitting into a media ideal of female beauty. But I really did have the feeling at the beginning when people were so critical where I was like, I'm gonna keep doing this till it's not a conversation to you anymore. <laughs> I would love it, my nudity to be depoliticized a little bit, but we're not at a place in our culture where we can do that yet. Whether you like it or not, you're also seen as the poster girl for a generation. How do you feel about that? Well, it's funny when I, I always say this, but when my character said, I'm the voice of a generation, she was on drugs. Like she wasn't, it wasn't like a claim, like I'm here world, get used to me. I thought it, and I'm sort of now accepting like that that's the line that's gonna follow me around till my grave and it's totally fine. But you know, I think it's like, we're living in this incredibly globalized tech savvy world where our generation is made up of, you know, far too many kinds of, of people with different sets of beliefs for any one person to represent them. But if I'm addressing any generational concerns, I'm happy with that. It's such a great pleasure to get to Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it.